Hello, good afternoon, good morning, good evening everyone. I hope you're well. I am being joined by Dr. Schmeichel from Medical Director at Laurel Fertility Care in San Francisco, California. And we're going to be talking all about embryology. So have your questions ready. Day three, day five, day six, uh, blast assists, what does that mean for success rates? How does the embryologist or fertility specialist pick the best embryo for transfer? How many do they transfer? Um, what can you learn from a cycle that may not have worked? There are so many amazing questions around PGTA, chromosomal testing, all sorts of topics which we'll be covering today. Uh, I'd love to know where you're dialing in from, watching from, and I'm going to see if Dr. Smichael is here now. Welcome everyone, nice to see you. He should be here any second. Laurel Fertility Care have written a brilliant article for us all around embryology, um, a Q&A with their uh, embryologist, uh, head of embryology, who's answered some, all of the questions we'll be going into today. So uh, head to our link in box um, as it is extremely useful knowledge and information. Hi, Dr. Spiegel. Oh, oh, we lost you. You're back. <laughs> How are you doing? I am Very well. so how are you? I can't complain too much. How are you doing? Good, thank you. It's hot. I'm sure it's hot in California, but it's hot for the UK. Well, I can understand that part. And, and I know that uh, it's a lot more, um, you know, there's an unbelievable amount of weather that's going on in Europe right now. So Yeah, you know, and we're just not geared up for it. We don't have the air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if I'm sweating, apologies, but um, I've just given a brief introduction about what we're going to be talking about today. For anyone who doesn't know you, please could you introduce yourself and Laurel Fertility Care, and then let's talk all about embryology. Okay. Um, I'm Colin Michael. I'm the medical director at Laurel Fertility Care. Uh, we're a fertility practice in the Bay Area in San Francisco, and we have offices in the Central Valley, Modesto, Oakland, and also in Fresno. And I'm happy to be with you and your group talking about embryology. Fantastic. And I was also saying everyone should head to our link in bio as we will link up an article which Laurel Fertility Care, um, the head of embryology, has written for us uh, all about picking the best embryo for transfer, what you're looking for, PGTA, chromosomes, um, everything that uh, readers are asking and I'm sure your patients ask all the time. So the first thing I want to ask you about is embryo grading. Please could you tell us a bit about that and how it's done and why? So, um, embryo grading started, um, um, I'd say, since the advent of uh, um, embryology when you, the, all embryology labs had to have a common way of describing embryos. It is a subjective grading, and the current grading system is developed by um, Gardner's profile, the one that we talk about, mm -hmm. and that looks at the embryos and from the standpoint first after fertilization to make sure they actually have um, what we call 2PN, meaning two pronuclei, um, two pronuclei within the cell. And as they grow, you'll end up having them develop into um, cleavage stage embryos, which are day two, day three embryos, and then blastocyst embryos. First, talking about the cleavage stage embryos, the thing we look at is uniformity in the cells. So typically on um, day three, or, uh, we're looking between say eight and 10 cells um, in the embryo. We wanna make sure that they're symmetric. And we also wanna make sure there's not really any cell fragments within the embryo. Um, so therefore you might actually see an um, eight cell embryo and we call it a, um, you know, a, a plus or a minus based on how much fragmentation there is. Fragmentation is just basically as the cell divides, um, you'll end up spitting off small pieces of the, the cell membrane. But those, when they coalesce, can sometimes, if there's a lot of them, then impede implantation in a day three embryo or day two embryo. As it, um, the embryo divides and develops and they move on to the blastocyst stage, a lot of those um, fragments become absorbed and then you'll end up having an embryo first form, what they call a morula, meaning they consolidate a lot of the cells, they morph, and they become um, a, a, what they call a blastocyst, that's what we wanna have. And then the expansion of that blastocyst is what we look at as far as grading. 
So the first from that standpoint you'll see is one that looks at the, the, the growth of that embryo. So we'll start at grade uh, uh, a three, with four, five, and six, meaning it's, as it grows, it's bigger. And so um, when it's six, it's when the embryo ex uh, is expanded out of the shell. And um, three is when beginning stage. So that's the first component. The second two components relates to what we call the inner cell mass, the part that becomes the baby. And the other one is the outer the part that becomes a placenta. And so we look at that in terms of uniformity within those structures. And so you'll end up having the grading of A for each component. So therefore you can have a 3AA, 3AB, 3A, uh, 4A, 4AB. And what you want to ideally look at is an embryo that's expanded, has an inner cell mass that's actually really uniform, and has a uniform amount of cells that are going to form the placenta. And then that's either a 4AA or 5AA embryo. That's the perfect embryo if you want, if you will. And so we look at those measures as ways of implantation. So, you know, when we're choosing embryos for transfer, we're looking at the best embryos within that system, whether it be a 4AA, 5AA embryo. There may be subtle difference between an A and a B embryo, so therefore we may choose those as well. But those are the ones that are going to have the highest amount of the, of the, the the most significant plantation. So that's what we look at. And if someone's got an embryo that's grade B or C, should they be, should they feel like it's all over? Well, um, it, it, I'd say the grade B embryo that it's probably not as worrisome because essentially it's, it is still subjective. So therefore it may end up having grade B meaning there's fewer cells that form the placenta mm -hmm. or grade B meaning there's fewer cells that form the inner you know, cell mass. And so therefore, those are probably not as worrisome. Implantation rates are slightly lower, but let's say that um, putting it um, directly, the implantation for a 4AA or 5AA embryo is gonna be you know, 60 or 70%. That for a, a embryo that actually has the, the part that becomes the surface become a little lower, so therefore it's a B embryo, that may end up being maybe 5% lower, so 55% rather than 60%. Okay. So therefore, that's actually a lot more. If you end up having fewer cells, like a C embryo, that means there's not many cells that form the, the, the surface around the embryo, then there's a less likelihood that it'll attach. Although it is actually something that can still implant, then the concern is that being, it may not be strong enough to continue to grow. We would still say it's worthwhile transferring that embryo. Um, and if you had to say there's a, um, if you look at the actual number, then rather than actually having a 60% chance of basically implanting, you may end up having only a 40% chance of implanting. Still worthwhile transferring, but it's a, it is gonna be a lower chance of success. Okay. Now, the other part too is that, that the part that becomes an inner cell mass, if that embryo actually has fewer cells, then that's another part that's concerning. So therefore, we typically would not wanna transfer um, the part that describes uh, an embryo as a, a a C for the inner cell mass, because you may end up getting pregnant, but you're more likely to not have a viable pregnancy. Not to say it's impossible, but just lower. And at Laurel Fertility Care, would you trans do you only transfer blastocysts? We primarily transfer blastocysts. So it all comes down to the number of embryos that get created. For there's some individuals who, for whatever reason, are unable to create blastocysts. Either they have very few eggs, and so therefore, when we fertilize them, we may not push them to grow blastocyst. And let's say as an individual who has only three eggs, and we fertilize them, and she has two embryos to transfer. Rather than actually pushing that embryo within the lab and then forcing it to go to blastocyst stage when it may not make it, we may elect to transfer that earlier after conversation with the patient. Because we know that some of those embryos that don't make that transition from day three to day five, may be normal. So therefore, it's still worthwhile transferring them at an early stage. So it all comes down to numbers and selection. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Could you tell us a bit about a mosaic embryo? What's that? So let's step back first and talk about what's a normal embryo, mm -hmm. and then we'll go back to what's a mosaic. So we talked about, um, you know, the embryo and talked about the fact that you end up having this 4AA embryo. So you have an inner cell mass and basically a placenta. So um, the part that, um, that formed the placenta, uh, we call the trophectoderm, 
what we do is we basically remove a few cells, typically about five or eight cells from that, send that off for genetic testing, and then you can actually get some information about that embryo. What you're looking at is that is the same as basically doing an amniocentesis after you get pregnant because you're looking at the form that becomes um, the fetus and it gives you some information about whether the embryo is normal. And so what you can get is that, um, that you'll end up finding out that the embryo is either genetically abnormal, meaning it has many abnormal cells and it doesn't have the full complement of chromosomes. And those we wouldn't recommend transferring at all. There are a few reported cases of embryos implanting, even though genetically abnormal, but you know, most would actually not recommend transferring those embryos because it's gonna have a lower chance of success or could end up having long-term uh, complications for the child. Is that um, the other, miscarriage as well? This, exactly, and then having a higher chance of miscarriage. The other extreme is basically having one that's entirely normal. So all the cells that are biopsied are normal. And those are easy to describe because you have a full complement of 46XX or 46XY. So those are easy to ones to kind of say that we will transfer those because they are more likely to result in a pregnancy and that pregnancy will be normal. The question you ask is what about those embryos that are actually somewhat in the middle? So therefore, they have some cells that are normal and then there are others that may be what we call abnormal. And that embryo is what we call a mosaic. So we know that basically just like in humans, there's a way for us to kind of basically sort through and remove those abnormal cells within the body. The embryo seems to do the same thing. So therefore, those embryos we may end up implanting, and then for um, lack of a better term, they may end up removing a lot of those abnormal cells and the infant will actually grow and be totally genetically normal. So those are what we call mosaic embryos. So if you think about it and you're thinking about uh, when you're looking at the cells, a full complement of 100 cells, only 20% of them are gonna be abnormal. That's what we call a low mosaic embryo. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're looking at a cell and 80% of those are abnormal, that's a high mosaic embryo. That high mosaic embryo is more likely to be abnormal, just as the ones that are completely abnormal. So most would actually not recommend transferring those high mosaic embryos. Whereas the ones that are low mosaic may be able to kind of recover, if you will, so then we would consider transferring those. It may not be the first one we consider transferring, but for someone who doesn't have many embryos or basically has gone through repeated cycles, that's one that we could transfer. Amazing information, thank you. Um, we had a ton of questions come through on stories mm -hmm. before tonight, so today. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Would you mind if I asked you a few from our readers, please? Definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, because it's on this topic. So you talked about embryo grading and picking the best mm -hmm. ones. Um, and someone has said, and this is a really good question, I have one frozen embryo left. Should I assume this was the worst one of the bunch because it's the last one left? Um, not entirely um, the case. It may just be if you did genetic testing, then we transfer all the ones that are genetically normal first and the, be the, the, the last looking one, if you will. There's some labs that only um, basically freeze excellent quality embryos, so therefore there's not really much difference between the first and the last. Um, but, you know, the goal is to basically transfer the best looking ones first. So it may be the ones that are actually going to be the uh, have the lowest potential, but many times you're actually looking at ones that are going to still have, to have a good chance of implanting. So I would still say something to consider. Great answer. Thank you very much. And if you have multiple embryos frozen, is there a selection process of which one you use first? Um, so it goes back to that Gardner grading system, the, uh, basically the 4AA, 5AA, 3A. So therefore, um, most lab will, will actually freeze embryos um, that are 3, 4, or 5, sometimes 6 um, ex expansion, if you will, and only for AA, AB, BA, or a, um, BA embryos. So those are primarily the ones you're looking at. Okay. So the, the ones we would transfer first are probably the ones that are 4, and then A, 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 A B, B, A, um, B, B. So therefore, those are the ones we primarily transfer first. Those are the ones that actually has the highest um, chance of implanting, um, you know, with that level. So if you have multiple embryos, we'll look at first the number 
and then the letters that basically allow us to kind of figure out which one is the best. Do you and just like, I'm sorry. Do you transfer mosaic embryos? Uh, we do transfer mosaic embryos on, under uh, circumstances when that's the only one they're available and the patient's exhausted their opportunity in terms of going for anything else. So therefore, we would consider that. We do counsel patients that they need to actually talk to genetics counsel before because they have to fully understand what it means to transfer a novel embryo because that child could end up having some abnormalities and they need to be able to be comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another question that has come in. Um, they have, this person has a perfect, has perfect embryo grading, but chromosomal abnormalities reported following PGTA testing. Is this mm -hmm. common? Unfortunately, yes. And I think that's actually one of the things where, especially in young patients, you say, well, all beautiful embryos, they're all four AA embryos, they're all four, you know, four AB embryos. And in the, under those circumstances, we would simply pick the best one and transfer them. The thing that we found out with genetic testing is just that um, genetic abnormalities are not really relevant to the grading. So therefore, you can end up having a perfect looking embryo that's genetically abnormal. So that's actually where, even though we look at grading as a way to kind of make selections of the embryo, we're always gonna ch um, choose the genetically normal embryo that transfers first, regardless of how it looks. So if you have embryos that are for AA, and you have several of those, and you have two embryos that are genetically normal, they are for AB or BA, we would transfer those embryos well before any of the other ones, even if they're mosaic, mm -hmm. only because normal is gonna be the most important part of the fact. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you for elaborating on that. Could you tell us a bit more about PGTA, which I know it used to be called PGS. So um, the, the, the reason for the change in the nomenclature was just that a lot of labs actually had a whole lot of different uh, you know, uh, information and became more of an, um, a matter for advertising rather than for actually the description of what was happening. And so uh, the uh, European um, uh, ESHRI and American, College, um, American um, Society of Reproductive Medicine came up with a common nomenclature so we could all have a common way of describing uh, the testing. So PG, um, PGT stands for pre-implantation pre genetic testing. That's, that basically covers all the biopsies that we do. And then A, is aneuploidy, so therefore you're looking at genetic abnormalities that are aneuploid. SR is structural rearrangement, so therefore there's a balanced translocations that you may actually devise. Um, M is mitotic um, a rearrangement, so therefore basically ones who basically have, let's say someone has cystic fibrosis or someone has sickle cell. Those are actually ones you can still screen to get information about those embryos that are genetically normal and then also test whether they have the, they have these genes. So that's the nomenclature. So A, what you asked about was aneuploid, and that's the one that's most commonly done. And um, in terms of transfers that you do at Laurel Fertility Care, would you always just transfer one embryo? Um, typically, uh, we only transfer one if you're genetically tested, and the reason for that is just that um, the implantation rate significantly higher the goal is to basically have a successful, safe pregnancy. I know that many people want to have um, twins. It sounds great. You know, um, you know in, in Hollywood, a lot of people describe the twins they have. The reality, it is, it is a high-risk pregnancy. Uh, you know, basically, uh, twins are born earlier. There's a higher risk of having complications. And, you know, uh, many patients have gone through significant struggles to get this far. And the last thing we want to do is to then basically have them have a child that's premature and have more complications. So that's what we talk about primarily in terms of doing it. Under some circumstances, we may transfer more, but that would be uh, usually, that's usually uncommon. Can it be age-related as well? Um, it is somewhat age-related. So, you know, that's one thing. Um, believe it or not, um, the older um, someone is, we're more likely we probably only recommend transferring one. Um, if you get older, there's a higher risk of having complications with the pregnancy, not necessarily with, um, you know, the, the, the fetuses that are developing, but um, older moms actually have a higher chance of having gestational diabetes, high blood pressure with pregnancy. So you have to look at that as the other complicating factors. 
having twins increases that even further. So therefore you'd wanna have someone who's older have a, a safer pregnancy. So that's when we offer would recommend transfer more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you. And um, should someone be disheartened if they're having a day three embryo transfer? I'd say no. Um, I'd say a lot of it has to do with, you know, basically um, looking at what, uh, you know, what are the circumstances arise. There's some women who has um, what we call um, low ovarian reserve, who in even an individual cycle, they only create one or two embryos. Those individuals, it's going to be far easier and far better to transfer earlier. Uh, there is some risk in terms of transferring, but it, um, it's trying to subject them to try to transfer at a blastocyst stage is not going to be worthwhile for them. And we've had a lot of successes in terms of people who have, especially when you're younger, who have um, you know low reserve who get pregnant um, with a day two or day three transfer. Okay, that's good to hear. Um, and w if you have an embryo to day six or day seven, does that mean that it's less likely to work? Uh, a day six embryo is probably not that significantly different from a day five embryo because a lot of it also has to do with the time that, uh, that the, the, embryo, the eggs are fertilized. Later in the day, it may just mean that, you know, it's technically a day five and a half. So it all has to do with, um, you know, from the development of the embryo itself. A day seven embryo may be a little bit further delayed, so therefore a lot more labs that basically either are not freezing on day seven. Um, we've had some success in terms of um, biopsying and transferring normal embryos from day seven, so therefore it's something that we still do. Um, I'll say that the implantation rate is lower. We talked about the different stages in terms of implantation in terms of a, a 4A8 embryo. A day five 4A8 embryo and a day seven 4A8 embryo may end up having different implantation, so therefore, although there could be success, it is somewhat lower. Uh, probably in the 30-40% range uh, for a day, a day 7 for a embryo, even if it's going to make it normal. Something basically inhibited the embryo developing, and that implantation may actually be effective as well. Okay, that's interesting to know. Um, tell us about what's happening in your lab at the moment. Are there, and is there any sort of new tech that's being, or techniques that are being used that are what, you know, worth explaining to people about behind the scenes? Well, um, we just renovated our lab and are now, um, in, in, you know, involved in terms of going through a lot in terms of we've already done, um, you know, polioscope to basically look at, um, um, egg, um, you know, the egg maturity um, as one way in terms of, of looking at things before. One of the, the hard parts is in terms of um, in checking um, pregnancy rates and fertilization is just that if you have fewer mature eggs before we strip them, um, then, you know, that in, in affect uh, the, the, the fertilization rate overall. If we can look and identify some of those eggs that may take a little bit longer to basically nurture within the lab before they're stripped, then they may end up actually having better fertilization and better plantation. So we're looking at different genomics as well in terms yep. of, you know, the, the things that, the biomes that the, um, the eggs um, and the, fer the embryos uh, give off to see if we can help to support the embryos. So. We're doing all we can to basically improve and, uh, you know, get better pregnancy rates. We're looking at timing for progesterone starts um, in terms of implantation as well. So all those things are basically trying to tweak to improve the overall experience and pregnancy mm -hmm. rates for patients. And what about time lapse? Um, time lapse photography is one of the things that we talked about um, doing. And I think the biggest thing is just that um, there is still debate whether um, it's actually is going to have a significant impact. Um, I'd say that time lapse, the, the discussion is whether you should have time lapse or genetic testing. Uh, we, there's a lot more information to say that genetic testing still provides a better chance for success. So we do a lot more genetic testing. I think, you know, as um, that becomes more developed and we end up having more information, we may do both. Currently, um, we're still exploring the information, exploring the technology to see what's going to be the best one for our purposes. Amazing. Okay. And last question. Um, in terms of PGTA genetic testing, um, do you do that with every patient? What's the criteria? Um, we definitely don't do it for every patient. I think we do it primarily for patients who are, you know, uh, older. So typically over 38, that's what we recommend and, and uh, you know, say that that's our, the most common um, thing to do. 
For younger patients, I'd say that, you know, um, they provide, they have a lot more eggs, a lot more uh, embryos. And so therefore, the, the many more of those embryos may be genetically normal. So therefore, it's a choice. So therefore, um, we, will, we won't say that we recommend that as, as stridently. We'd always encourage patients to have it done, but I'd say it's not something that we strongly um, urge. Um, for I'd say that if you put it in categories, um, more than 50% of patients who are going to be younger than 35 will have it done. I'd say more than 90% of those that are older than 38 are going to have it done. Mm -hmm. If they have the embryos to kind of do that. Absolutely. Um, for anyone who's joined or watching now, please head to our link in bio. We're going to link this up to this fabulous article. Very insightful from the uh, team at Laurel Fertility Care. Um, and as always, uh, they're very happy to consult with anyone who's watching and would love to uh, help you on your journey uh, to success. So please do DM them, DM us, and we can pop you in touch. Um, and yeah, we, we love speaking with you, Dr. Michael. And I'm very excited because we're going to be meeting in person in October. I'm coming over to the States and it will be great to meet in person. It will be a wonderful, wonderful meeting after all these discussions. So I know. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you everyone for joining and uh, we'll see you next time. Okay. Bye thank now. You. Bye. Yeah. Bye.